Hello and welcome to our special look at 22 of the top stories of the television era in Buffalo. I'm Dave McKinley. The first thing one needs to do in compiling such a list is determine how you pick out of all these significant stories a top 22. Are they the ones that affected the most people, the ones which had the most lasting impact on West of New York? Are they the most memorable or the ones which we spent the most amount of time covering. There are a lot of ways of looking at this. To help us out, we formed a panel consisting of eight current and former members of the Channel 2 News team, as well as former Buffalo Common Council President and Urban League Vice Chairman James Pitts, and longtime Buffalo News critic, columnist, and cultural editor Jeff Simon. From a list of nearly 50 memorable stories to consider, panel members chose their top 22 and ranked them. The stories were then scored based on the number of votes they received. Out of the top 22 stories eventually selected, only three of them appeared on every ballot submitted by the panelists. This also means there were many stories worthy of inclusion which received votes but through the scoring didn't quite make it into the top 22. We'll be taking a look at those honorable mentions as well throughout our program, but for now, let the countdown begin. Number 22, Metro Rail. When it opened in 1985 at a cost of $550 million, it was the most expensive public works project in Buffalo's history. Adjusted for inflation, that amount today, $1.4 billion, would be around the amount it might take to build a new stadium. Construction took seven years to complete, changed the face of Main Street, some would say, to its detriment. And almost 40 years later, it's still operating much as it did, never having been expanded. But the debate on whether it should and where it might is still very much alive today. Number 21, Bye Bye Braves. In a city where major league professional sports teams have lost some big games in heartbreaking fashion, imagine the heartbreak of losing an entire team. The Braves played in the NBA in the 1970s, but late in the decade, the owner of the Boston Celtics, who wanted to have a team in his native San Diego but knew the league would not let him move the Celtics, approached the owner of the Braves and said, how about we trade teams? The swap was made, the league had no problem moving the Braves to San Diego, and it was game over for the NBA in Buffalo. Number 20, Madam Governor. This story, besides being number 20 on our list, is also the newest one. Just six months ago, when Andrew Cuomo facing certain impeachment due to several scandals, including one involving sexual harassment, resigned, Kathy Hochul, as Lieutenant Governor, ascended to not only becoming the first female governor in state history, but the first Western New Yorker to hold the office in more than a century. Number 19, Summer of Protest. When a man named George Floyd was killed at the hands of Minneapolis police in 2020, the cries for justice rang across the nation and spilled into the streets, including in Buffalo, with thousands marching in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. While marked by pockets of violence, the demonstrations in Buffalo calling for social justice and police reforms were mostly peaceful, unlike in some parts of the country where there was rioting, looting, and burning. Number 18, October Surprise. It is not unusual for snow to fall here in mid-October, but it is when you get feet of it, such as what happened in 2006. The problem was that the leaves were still on the trees, the load of the heavy wet snow which clung to them, too much to bear for the branches, which came crashing down on power lines, leaving hundreds of thousands without power, some for almost two weeks. If there was a saving grace, well, it was October, so no one froze without heat or power because temperatures were back to normal and the snow was gone within a few days. The mess left behind though took weeks to clean up and in just the city of Buffalo more than 90 percent of the trees sustained damage and a good number of them were lost. Number 17, murder of Bernard Slepian, hunt for James Cop. In October 1998, Dr. Bernard Slepian, an OBGYN who performed abortions, was shot and killed in his kitchen by a sniper who fired from a wooded area behind Slepian's Amherst home. What became an international manhunt concluded about three and a half years later with the arrest in France of James Cop. Charged in both state and federal courts, it took more than a year to extradite Cop. And it wasn't until nearly nine years after Slepian's murder that he was ultimately sentenced to life in prison, where he remains today at age 67. 
Number 16, if you build it, they will come. When it opened in 1988 as Pilot Field, Buffalo's new downtown ballpark was part of a bigger story. The Rich family's dream to bring Major League Baseball to Buffalo. Designed to be expanded to accommodate that, it was also the first in the nation to be built in the now popular retro classic design. It attracted praise and fans as for several years, as the pitch for a Major League team continued, the AAA Bisons drew more than a million fans per season, outpacing the attendance of several major league teams. In the end, the major league dreams were just that, save for the past couple of seasons when due to COVID, the Toronto Blue Jays temporarily nested here. Now known as Salem Stadium, it remains, though, the largest capacity AAA stadium in the United States. Coming up, our top 22 countdown continues, but as we go to break, here's a look at some other stories from our honorable mention list. Welcome back to our look at 22 top stories from the television era in Buffalo. I'm Dave McKinley. As we continue our countdown, we're also taking a look at other significant stories which garnered votes from our panel determining the top 22, but not enough to make the final list. This includes the Buffalo Billion, a heavy infusion of state resources to try and kickstart the local economy. Launched 10 years ago, it resulted in, among other things, construction of what is now the Tesla plant at Riverbend, but also several convictions of those associated with the Buffalo Billion's program on corruption charges. The birth of the Buffalo Savers, who began play as an NHL expansion franchise in 1970 and whose French connection led them to the Stanley Cup Finals in just their fourth season of play. And you can't mention the Savers without the story of No Goal, the controversial call surrounding the winning score by Brett Hall with his foot in the crease. When the Savers lost to the Dallas Stars in Buffalo's last trip to the Stanley Cup Finals in the third overtime of Game 6 of that series in 1999. How about the Pagulas and their purchase of both the Buffalo Sabres and the Buffalo Bills to keep those franchises here, along with their investment of properties downtown? Another big story involved another owner of the Sabres, cable TV magnate John Regas, who saw his Adelphia cable empire crumble when he was sent to prison on multiple charges of fraud. There was the demolition of Memorial Auditorium in 2009, which for more than half a century hosted sporting events, concerts, shows of all sorts, and was a place of memories for millions. The construction of Rich Stadium, which was done in order to keep the Bills from moving out of Buffalo, and which now as Highmark Stadium still serves as the home of the Bills some 50 years later. The story of Stefano Magadino, boss of the Buffalo Mafia, who quietly ran a funeral home in Niagara Falls, but whose influence in the underworld stretched from here to Ohio and into southern Ontario, and who as Don was a charter member of the Mafia's national ruling council called the Commission. And the Erie County budget crisis of 2005, which resulted in county finances being placed under a control board and brought the terms red budget and green budget into the local vernacular. And now, our countdown continues. 
Number 15, Rebirth of the Waterfront. Buffalo's waterfront was essential to the growth of business in the city's industrial heyday of the 20th century, but it wasn't a place to visit, let alone reside, polluted and cut off by construction of the thruway. A sea change began with an emphasis on environmental cleanup and public access, which started in earnest in the 1970s with Erie Basin Marina, and then high-end condos and apartments eventually to Canal Side, Riverworks, and the Outer Harbor, which through restoration of natural settings and a planned amphitheater continue that trend. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither will the new waterfront be, with additional chapters to this story to be written for years to come. Number 14, five men down. The largest single-day loss of life for the Buffalo Fire Department occurred two days after Christmas in 1983. While responding to a leaking propane tank at a radiator warehouse on North Division Street, five firefighters and two civilians were killed when the tank exploded. Damage from the blast was found in buildings up to a half mile from the scene, and more than 150 people were injured by it. 38 years later, the site remains barren, save for the memorial at Fire Call Box 191, where the tragedy occurred. Number 13, Bike Path Rapist Caught. In 2007, one of the most notorious criminals in Western New York history was arrested, ending a reign of terror which some lawmen believe began 31 years before. An unassuming factory worker, a family man well-liked by neighbors living in Chictawaga named Altemio Sanchez. Those suspected of raping and or killing up to 15 women and girls, with many of those crimes occurring near secluded areas of bike paths and walking trails, Sanchez eventually pled to three murders, for which he is now serving a 75-year-to-life sentence. Police were finally able to make the case against him by getting his DNA from a napkin he used to wipe his face at a restaurant. His arrest also led to the exoneration of Anthony Capozzi, who had served 22 years in prison for rapes where DNA evidence now points to Sanchez as the perpetrator, but for which he has never been charged. Number 12, the pre-sex abuse scandal. It's a story that stretches back long before television was even invented, men of the cloth preying on parishioners, most of them young. The scandal involved the church cover-up, with priests accused, even credibly, far from being defrocked, being transferred to other parishes where the abuse continued. The story exploded in more recent years with the Child Victims Act, allowing the abused to bring civil lawsuits for that which occurred beyond the traditional statute of limitations. In the two-year window provided for them to do so, more than 11,000 such suits were filed in New York State, and not just involving priests, but teachers, scout leaders, and others. The onslaught of lawsuits involving priests, though, forced the Buffalo Catholic Diocese, like several others, to declare bankruptcy. Number 11, the birth of the Bills. Though a pro football team called the Bills played in the All-America Conference for three seasons in the late 40s, it wasn't until 1960 that the team you now know was born in the American Football League when a Detroit businessman named Ralph Wilson, whose first choice was to put his franchise in Miami, settled on Buffalo when his deal down south fell through. Initially, we may not have done a lot of coverage when those Bills were conceived. It was an upstart league, after all, and its owners, including Wilson, were referred to as being part of the Foolish Club. But... The birth of the Bills makes our list because of what they would grow to be and what they remain to be in Buffalo today. Number 10, COVID-19. Even if you never caught it, even if you can say you never knew anyone who did, no one was immune from the eventual fallout from coronavirus, if for no other reason than the disruption in one form or another to our everyday lives, whether it was a change in how we worked or if we worked how we shopped, where we could go, under what restrictions, how our children learned, or mandates involving vaccines or masks or gatherings, or the division resulting from our varied opinions on it all. It is without doubt that this story of literally pandemic proportion is the only one on this list which has impacted every single one of us and the one to which we have devoted more hours of coverage than any other, and we haven't finished yet. Number nine, OJ. For a generation of fans of Buffalo's most popular sports franchise, O.J. Simpson was nothing short of an icon. His becoming the first NFL player to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a season made him a national superstar. And even after he hung up his cleats, his star continued to shine as a popular pitch man, movie actor, and network football analyst. But in 1994, he was charged with the brutal murders of his wife, Nicole, and her friend, Ron Goldman, and a nation watched in fascination, a slow-speed chase in a white Ford Bronco 
toward a trial which would span 11 months, broadcast gavel to gavel to millions until his eventual acquittal. It was a big enough story to send our reporters clear across the country to cover it. Simpson would later serve 10 years in prison for armed robbery and assault before being released in 2017. Whether through fame or through infamy, O.J. was one of the biggest stories of the television era in Buffalo. Number 8. 22 caliber killer. In September of 1980, three men and one boy were killed within 36 hours of each other in the Buffalo area by someone using a 22 caliber weapon. In October, two more murders. This time the victims were beaten, their bodies mutilated. Then, on a single day in December, four more murders. Within an eight hour period, all in New York City, where each victim was stabbed to death. And one week after that, Two more fatal stabbings, one in Buffalo and one in Rochester. The common thread between the 12 murders and seven attacks where the victims survived, all within four months, were that all of the victims were black. Cops who'd figured a serial killer was lurking got their breakdown at Fort Benning, Georgia, of all places, where an army private named Joseph Christopher attacked a black soldier with a paring knife and told a psychiatrist that he had to kill blacks. Buffalo police soon obtained a warrant and searched his home where evidence linking him to the first of the murders was found. Christopher was eventually convicted of three killings and sent to prison where he only lived to be 37, dying behind the walls of a rare form of male breast cancer in 1993. Number seven. The Super Bills. A little over a generation ago, a team loaded with all pros, many of whom would become Hall of Famers, accomplished a feat never done before or since by any other. When the Bills went to four consecutive Super Bowls, through all those years, Bills fever was at a fervent pitch, and we spent enormous amounts of time bringing the story home. Of course, whether they were just a shade white right, or if since then by some home run throwback Music City miracle, or even if just by a measly 13 seconds, the thirst for an NFL championship for the Bills remains one to be quenched. Number six, Timothy McVeigh. When in April of 1995, a truck bomb destroyed the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, the nation was shocked and grieved at the carnage and the loss of 168 lives. The shock deepened when it was determined that this was an act of domestic terrorism. And it deepened further in our region when it was learned that one of the perpetrators was a Western New Yorker. Timothy McVeigh, a 26-year-old Gulf War veteran and graduate of Star Point High School and whose family still lived in Pendleton. Two years later, in 1997, McVeigh was convicted on all the charges against him by a jury which recommended he be put to death which he was in June of 2001 at a federal prison in Indiana at the age of 33. Number 5, 3407. In February of 2009, Continental Connection Flight 3407 from Newark to Buffalo crashed five miles short of landing in Clarence Center. All 49 souls on board were killed in addition to a man into whose home the plane had crashed. The accident investigation found that pilot error was the cause, and 11 years later, it remains the most recent domestic aviation accident involving a U.S.-based airline that resulted in mass casualties. Some credit that to the tireless efforts of the loved ones and survivors of those killed who, once their lawsuits were settled, worked tirelessly to improve airline safety and getting Congress to enact several measures to that end, including more stringent pilot training. Coming up... An environmental disaster from fire to rust, a bloody rebellion, and a nightmare storm. They top the list of our top 22, which we'll have for you right after this. Welcome back to our countdown of 22 top stories from the television era in Buffalo. We're just about ready to reveal the top four, but before we do, a look at some more honorable mentions, stories which received votes from our panel, but which scored just outside of making the top 22 list. These included, of course, 9-11, the terror attacks on America, which did not occur here but claimed the lives of several people with Western New York roots in 2001. A modern generation's Pearl Harbor, 9-11 affected all of us through an outpouring of patriotism where we gave our time, our treasure, and our blood. It launched our nation into war 
and changed it forever. There was the seven-year-long saga of Terry Anderson, the Associated Press reporter who grew up in Batavia and who in 1985 was one of several Westerners taken hostage by Hezbollah, becoming the longest held of those hostages until his release in 1991. Much of this story also included the non-stop efforts of his sister, Peggy Say, during Anderson's captivity to free him. The Lackawanna Six, whose arrest brought the national media descending on Buffalo. The story involved a half dozen Yemeni American friends suspected of being part of a terror cell right here in western New York, where each facing a potential death sentence if convicted of being enemy combatants eventually pled guilty to providing material support to Al-Qaeda after admitting they had attended an Al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. The five-month manhunt in 2006 for Ralph Bucky Phillips, who after walking away from an Erie County jail became one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives and who during his time on the lam shot three state troopers, one of whom died. And now to the conclusion of our countdown. Number four, Love Canal. When toxic chemicals began gurgling up from basements and sewers in a Niagara Falls neighborhood in the late 1970s, it set off a firestorm above the ground. It eventually led to the evacuation of 800 families and the demolition of more than 400 homes. The name of the neighborhood, Love Canal, became synonymous with environmental catastrophe. The magnitude was so great that President Carter declared it a federal health emergency and it marked the first time FEMA funds were used for a man-made disaster. Love Canal also became the impetus for the creation of the EPA Superfund and was the first entry on a list of what would grow to be more than 1,700 toxic waste sites tab for cleanup across the country. It took years to settle the lawsuits and for anyone to be allowed to buy homes on the outer ring of the disaster area. Many of the chemicals dumped in the 40s and 50s remain, but are contained and monitored for signs of leaching from the area, which is still fenced off today. Number three, from fire to rust. Since 1900, it stood like a city of its own. The Bethlehem Steel Plant sprawled over two miles of Lake Erie shoreline in Lackawanna. But in 1983, the furnaces of the nation's third largest steel mill, which once employed 22,000 people, went cold and changed the local economy forever. And it wasn't just steel workers out of jobs facing a $4 million annual loss in property tax revenue. The city of Lackawanna laid off 100 city workers and 18 police officers. To this day, efforts remain to fill the once bustling site with new industries. Number two, Attica. On September 9, 1971, inmates at Attica State Prison rebelled and took over the facility. When control was retaken by state police using helicopters, tear gas, and rifles, four days later, it became and remains the bloodiest prison uprising in U.S. history. 43 lives lost, including 10 prison guards who'd been taken hostage. Most of the deaths were from bullets fired by lawmen retaking the prison. It took more than three decades to settle the lawsuits filed by the families of those killed, both guards and prisoners, and with the state paying $24 million, minus $4 million in court costs. Number one, the blizzard of 77. Now, we've had our share of weather, but this is still largely regarded by many as the biggest, baddest, blowingest, beastliest behemoth of them all. After 34 days of below freezing temperatures and 28 days of snow, a snowpack several feet deep had formed on a frozen Lake Erie. On Friday, January 28th, a weather system with near hurricane force winds came through and began blowing it into Buffalo. The system stalled. The blizzard raged for four days, drifting snow up to 30 feet in height. In the end, the financial tab was $541 million, adjusted for inflation, more than $2 billion in today's money. There were 23 deaths attributed to the storm. A quarter of those were people who froze in their stranded cars in the sub-zero temperatures. The blizzard was national news, and Buffalo became the butt of jokes by late-night talk show comedians. And still to this day, this storm is more responsible than any other for the perception, or in many cases, misperceptions by outsiders of Buffalo's weather. The blizzard of 77 was one of the three stories which appeared on every ballot submitted by our panelists, which helped us determine the top 22. The others were the Attica riots and the four trips to the Super Bowl by the Buffalo Bills. If there's one thing that can be taken from all of this, it's that the news isn't always good, but it is always good to be informed. 
We hope you enjoyed our look at 22 top stories from the television era in Buffalo. I'm Dave McKinley. Thanks for watching.